Welcome to VO Life, brought to you by Gravy for the Brain Oceania. My name is Toby Ricketts. I am your host. We talk to the big thought leaders in voiceover and the related industries. And I'm very excited to have a guest today who needs no introduction, really. It's David Cicerelli from Voices.com. How are you today, David? I'm doing great. Better now that I'm here, Toby. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, to have a conversation, really, and uh, to talk shop, as they say, uh, about all things VO. Absolutely, exactly. And I mean, hot off the press this morning, it was great timing because an announcement by uh, from one of your biggest competitors, uh, Voice123, has been acquired by Backstage. So right off the bat, any sort of like thoughts? Does this change the industry at all in your in your view? Well, you know, I think the industry over, like many, uh, over the years has certainly, you know, p- players get bigger and, and eventually consolidate. There's new ones that come, uh, you know, new platforms that emerge. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that was, a you know, perhaps an inevitable outcome at, at some point. Um, and I mean, congratulations to both Backstage and, and Voice 23, even pulling off, uh, you know, a merger or kind of an, uh, an acquisition like that is uh, certainly quite an effort. And uh, we can talk about our, our own experience of Voices doing, uh, making similar moves. Um, but, you know, Backstage has been, you know, a, a, an authority and leader in the on-camera world you know, first and foremost through their their magazine, uh, their print magazine, which they had run for, I believe, almost 50 or more than 50 years. And then now with online casting in uh, on, on camera predominantly. Um, and, you know, we uh, S- uh, Stephanie Cicerelli, my wife and, and co-founder of Voices, she uh, once wrote for Backstage as well, too. So I think they were interested in uh, entering into voice acting in a, in a bigger way. Um, but Backstage actually has maintained a, let's call it a house of brands type of approach. They don't necessarily merge everything uh, all together. There are other music websites um, that they have acquired uh, over the years and then uh, run them as standalone entities. Mm. So, uh, you know, if uh, history repeats itself, they'll probably do the same thing uh, mm. with, uh, with voice one, two, three, um, mm. at least for, at least for a while. And, uh, you know, but it'll be uh, interesting to see how it all plays out. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't change your strategy in terms of voices being a kind of a, you know, it's like you're the two biggest players. It doesn't change your, your, your thinking. Not, not at present. Um, you know, we, ha- we maintain, um, you know, a, more, more than a list. It's actually an entire, um, you know, a lot of software or technology companies, maintain these 10 competitive intelligence platforms, basically news clippings, um, web analytics, any insights um, that uh, analysts reports, these type of things that, um, you know, it's all public information, but it does serve as a repository. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so types of things that we look for are, you know, changes to key pages on their website. Are they hiring in new positions, right? That uh, might indicate Mm -hmm. a change in their strategy and so those are the type of things that uh, that we look for. But uh, given it's uh, you know recent news, um, you know we'll, we'll certainly keep our our uh, eyes and ears open. Um, and who knows, it might uh, it might actually open the door to another uh, relationship with Backstage for us. Given we've actually been um, in dialogue, uh, you know, every time I'm in. Uh, New York and specifically Brooklyn, you know, visit their offices and say hello and and try to keep a, a cordial relationship going. Fantastic. Wonderful. So you've been the, the CEO of, uh, of Voices.com for 16 years. You know, it's the, it's, it's the biggest platform um, in the market there. Um, what kind of metrics do you have around that sort of biggestness, like the, the number of voices, the number of clients? How do you sort of measure your place in the industry? Well, the first and um, well, uh, the first and foremost is, is actually just looking at just pure number of registered users. How many people are um, kind of putting up their hands saying, I want to participate in the industry in, in some way or another? And, uh, you know, recently we crossed over, actually it was just last year, we crossed over 1 million registered users. And since the onset of COVID, I think it's ushered in a whole new wave of um, aspiring talent, um, people who maybe have always wanted, had the dream, they want to get into it. Um, Unfortunately, perhaps they were even laid off from their previous position and found themselves at home saying, I have skills and abilities how can I be, you know, pursuing a career I've always wanted to, uh, or uh, or generating income otherwise? And um, so that I think again has has ushered in, you know, another million registered users. Now, when I say registered users, um, really these are people who've signed up. Maybe they've uploaded a demo, um, which obviously is a 
critical prerequisite, as you know. Um, but you know, a lot of people are just trying to gain uh, information. But in terms of you know, to to uh, you know, what, what what matters candidly a lot more is actually the volume of job postings that are coming uh, to the website. So we're kind of just north of the five thousand job postings uh, a month uh, coming to Voices. You know, across you know all manner of industries, all types and genres of of uh, VO. And, um, you know, there's this kind of core group of about 40, 42,000 clients that are posting jobs on, uh, on a quite a routine basis. Uh, and so those are, you know, some of the metrics just to give a sense. Um, but really at the end of the day, it's like, we're doing our job if we're bringing jobs to the platform Hmm. that, uh, all of you talent Hmm. can, uh, can pursue audition for and, uh, and obviously hopefully win that work. Absolutely. I mean, lots of, um, uh, it, it seemed like for a while there, a new P2P would start every week and telling everyone that they were the new uh, the new kid in town and they were going to be the biggest within a year. But it all comes down to jobs. Like that's that's entirely what, what voice talent want to see on the platform. They, don't, they, they, they kind of don't want the stuff around the edges. It's just like, is this going to feed me? Um, yeah. how, what do you think has been your, your strategy and the successful um, behaviors and um, activities that you've done that has led to you sort of being having the most jobs of any P2P? Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that you you brought that up of the the number of new entrants, right? And this might sound like a page of a you know Harvard MBA, but there's this concept of like you need for a marketplace like this, you need supply or service providers who are all the talent. You need the demand, um, but you have this other force which are like you know you have your existing known competitors, but then you have this other force of these new entrants that come in constantly that create a lot of kind of hoopla and candidly a little bit of a distraction. And, um, you know, having been doing this for, as you say, 16 years, I've counted at one point I had a list of over a hundred sites that have kind of come and gone. And it's, it's like literally they're just repeating the same playbook, which is we're going to be the best site for talent. But what, uh, the, the secret sauce actually is, in order to be the best type site for talent, it's not about having the most beautiful profiles or kind of certain gimmicky features. It's actually the site that can win over the clients that are um, bringing, you know, bringing those jobs to the platform. We run surveys to um, our you know, top tier platinum talent, to premium talent. And we always ask like, what, what do you find most valuable? Is it great customer service? Are these excellent downloadable resources and more of it? And they're like, these are all nice to haves. But the only thing in terms of measuring a talent success on the platform, when they, the end of the year, like, do I renew my, my subscription? Are we going to continue with this? Everyone's just going, did I make two, three, 10 X my return on my, on my subscription? That's kind of the, the mental math that we see people uh, go through. And so to, to answer the question, how do we um, try to kind of live that out and fulfill that need? And, um, Almost to the exclusion of like virtually everything else, we we market, um, we build products with a dare I say a bias towards bringing more clients onto the platform. It's not that we're neglecting talent. We just know that you can build things for talent that sound nice, but the way we're being held to account and our measure of success is: did I get a return on my investment in terms of volume of uh, volume of work? Mm. Um, so there is that tendency towards clients. We love the talent community. We spend a lot of time and energy and outreach and trying to build one-on-one relationships, but we've just found that sometimes that tiebreaker needs to be, what is, is this client going, or is this going to help a client go through the process faster and easier and come back again to hire yet another talent? Mm. Um, so that's kind of been one thing and that, that permeates Toby product decisions, hiring decisions, um, marketing campaign decisions. Um, and, and so th- those are, um, it's just having that, it's, it's not going to be a 50, 50 split. It might be more like 60, 70, 80% of our time and energy, um, might be on the client end of the business so that it can ultimately, we can, we can satisfy the needs of the talent. Mm, mm. Do you see clients at all kind of um, <clears throat> like um, defining, like changing the way voiceover, um, voiceovers are behaving? Um, like there, there was lots of talk about this kind of, there was this race to the bottom about sort of three or four minutes, this, this, this phrase that got thrown around, the race to the bottom, which I think 
no one can say has actually happened. Like, there's definitely been a fragmentation at the very bottom of the market, which was always going to happen because you get, you know, mm-hmm. everyone suddenly needs a video and small businesses can't afford, you know, $5,000 for a video, for example. So there's going to mm-hmm. be a lot of small jobs. But I don't think the race, the, the, the fears of the race to the bottom have actually occurred. And Voices.com certainly hasn't been like, um, hasn't, uh, you know, driven down prices um, from what I've seen. Um, are, there, are there other pressures that come from clients that would negatively affect the voiceovers, do you think? Or, or uh, I mean, you're kind of the, the gatekeepers in a way um, who are looking, trying to, you know, you're trying to look after both parties at the same time because mm-hmm. you don't want to alienate talent, you don't want to alienate the clients because that's where the work comes from. Um, do you see any sort of big, big changes in the industry in terms of how clients are requesting voiceover these days? Well, well, if 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 I may, I I, I love the unpack the race to the bottom, um, oh, sure. you yeah. know, uh, hypothesis. Let's mm. call it that. Um, and thank you for acknowledging at least you know anecdotally from your perspective, not seeing that happen either. We we measure this concept actually very you know numerically called ASP, average selling price. What is the average selling price that we can get a job fulfilled on the platform? And just because the entry level budget range was 100 to 250 dollars um us uh us dollars doesn't mean every job is 100 to 250 dollars sure call it half of them are but the other half are five you know 250 to 500 500 to 750 and then it goes up from there now you get the few whales that are in there that are the 10 and 20 thousand dollars that's going to bring up the average uh, average selling price um you can think of that as like the amount that the job kind of, as they say, cleared for uh, was was ultimately hired for. Um, what we because we measure that, um, we are also incentivized. And I'll you know be very candid about this. And it's not just a phrase; it's a belief that we have that our business actually is based on shared success with the talent. So just think about this: we want talent to be quoting higher and higher and higher because we generate a 20% platform fee um, f- upon that success. If we can if we can find that client a talent that they want to work with and they hire them, then at, at the higher and higher prices year after year, the talent becomes happy. We dispel this myth of race to the bottom and um, voices likewise is, uh, is increasingly generating more revenue that we obviously go to invest uh, into winning over the next client to bring them uh, onto the platform, uh, as well as you know, pro- product and development uh, improvements as well. So I actually think that our um, intentions and our outcomes are aligned in terms of voices and the talent. We want prices to go higher. So how how might we do that? A couple examples. We have a rate sheet, which is barely just a. There's lots of great ones out there. The GVAA has a very very detailed rate sheet. Ours is just kind of a quick tear sheet. Like you need a quick and dirty reference of what something might go for. Um, it was to answer a question, what do I charge for X? That's really all the rate sheet was on voices. Um, but we've actually increased kind of like the budget ranges over the years. Like something might might have been in the 100 to 250 um, bracket before, but now we, we nudge that up to the next bracket. So that's kind of a soft influencer. The other one is the when the client goes to post a job on voices, we actually have a price recommendation engine. And so what it does is when they're filling out the job, we say, hey, based upon other jobs that were similar to yours, we recommend a budget range of 1,000 to uh, 1,250. And by providing that, it actually overcomes a lot of anxiety for first time clients. They've never hired a talent before. You're a junior creative producer at you know said ad agency you know you've been asked to hire a talent for the first time you know you're doing some research your main objective is to hire the talent but you also want to get a good quality talent i want to therefore quote appropriately i just don't know what so this price recommendation engine is is another way um to do so uh and so i mean those are kind of two tactical ways that i think demonstrate hopefully to the community that we actually, our, our incentives and our outcomes are completely aligned. Um, so we haven't uh, seen uh, this, uh, you, know, you know, proverbial race to the bottom. And lastly, if, if I may, I think it, it actually is uh, uh, this, this concept, which, you know, maybe some of, some of the viewers have actually heard me speak about before, which I call the Goldilocks effect, which is when you're a client and you're seeing and listening to talent and you're seeing quotes of all of these ranges, 
t- you know, you can, you know, talent have five stars. They're great. Why would I go with, you know, if I, the lowest, the lowest quote um, on uh, on the responses list, um, it's kind of raising some red flags. You know, it's like you don't want to be too hot and over quote. You also don't want to be under. Um, so what we've seen invariably when there's this, um, you know, a range provided, in, in, invariably the 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 winning talent is within the middle of the range. Now it's not you know precisely in some kind of odd numbers, but it's it's it kind of averages out that it's within the range. It's certainly not below. I think that scares clients off to go. Are there some other? Uh, you know, do you have to go book a studio? Is there something else I don't know? Is this a new talent that really doesn't quite have the skills um, to be able to deliver it? And then if you're over quoting, you might have priced yourself out of the market because if they're competing, you know, uh, you know, and I use air quotes on that term, but if, if, if there are three talent that are like, you know, equally good, then the client's probably going to go for one that, you know, maybe a bit less, um, but they tend to get scared. Uh, we've just seen kind of that behavior. They tend to get scared at kind of going right at the the low end or below. Mm. Um, so we always advocate just quote within the middle of the range, do your best read, deliver, uh, deliver that, um, quote what you, you, you want. That's kind of part of the idea is like empowering the talent to, to quote what they want. But yeah, I mean, a, a long winded way, I guess, of saying we've just not seen that um, play out mostly because we believe our, our incentives are aligned around shared success. Mm, absolutely. Um, and I asked this question to uh, to both Armin and uh, Rolf, who I've previously had on the interview, who have uh, P2P marketplaces. Um, and the question was around, uh, you know, free market economics and whether there is a role for like uh, voiceover marketplaces to start telling clients what they should be charging or whether to leave it up to free market and um, economics to sort it out. Um, and you've kind of gone over some of this already, but, you know, do you think it's it's the place to educate clients on what they should be paying or is it just what, what someone will pay? Uh, well, we, we've taken the approach to, um, I, I mean, not to be too forthcoming about it, but we, we definitely take the approach of guiding that because we need to, it's one thing to get the job posted, okay? Um, it's another thing to get the job fulfilled. Yes, we need to have appropriate talent that are able and capable to do it, but the talent will only do so if the budget range is attractive enough, right? And mm-hmm. sure, we might say, oh, well, there's there's always a talent who will do something for $25 or $5. And it's like, but th- that's not the type of client that we want to attract. And I think that would degrade the kind of premium brand that we're trying to create at Voices that has not only the most jobs, but hopefully the highest paying jobs of mm-hmm. online uh, platforms. Um, and in order to achieve that, yes, we need to, you know, inform and educate the client. Um, and we do that through, you know, marketing collateral, blog posts, these one pagers, um, as well as practically when they're going through that job posting. If you never read any marketing material and don't look at a blog, when you're at the moment of truth of posting that job on Voices, we, we need to make that recommendation there. And that's actually improved um, the, the uh, you know, the going back to this, this uh, metric, this average selling price by just nudging up uh, those prices. And the clients seem to be happy with the caliber of talent because it's attracting a higher budget is going to attract the higher caliber or capable talent on the platform as well. Mm, yeah, fantastic. So, so I'm um, going to say, sir, Toby, I think we have a light touch on mm. that. I don't think it's forceful. Mm. Um, they can override that recommendation. They can ignore it. But I think it's a light touch approach um, at that moment of truth. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there are lots of resources for new talent to find out what to charge on the internet. Um, as well, I want to throw into the ring the, the Gravy for the Brain rate card, which is at rates.gravyforthebrain.com. Um, and, and and everyone, it's that funny thing where um, we're in this industry. It's very exciting because it's it's... It's a disruptive industry. It's changing so quickly. Um, there's there's new stuff happening all the time, and rates is one of those things which has been affected. And everyone's kind of got their own spin on how to make it work. I've got quite an unusual one, which I've shared with a few people before, based on sort of company size. But no one's really nailed the way to accurately price a job in the digital era. I think is the key thing because when it was broadcast, it was kind of easy um, because it would be like you know viewerships and you knew all that stuff. But now you can voice something and it can just completely go viral and have you know, five million views, or it can have five hundred views, and mm-hmm. so. 
it's difficult to price that at the outside and uh, outset and give people certainty. But um, I don't want to get too bogged down in rates, but uh, but but uh, yeah, it's it's a definitely an interesting time. Um, how has um, Voices dot com? What do you think some of the key moments of the evolution were in your business model? Because you know you've been around for for more than sixteen years. Mm-hmm. Um, you've really seen the voiceover industry go from a complete bricks and mortar um, institution where people had to live close to a studio. They didn't even have home studios. Now you have to have a home studio. I live in the middle of the New Zealand jungle and managed to carve out this the voiceover career, which would never have been possible even probably five or six years ago. Um, has Voices.com been a part of that evolution? And like, what have been the key moments for you um, in, in shaking things up and, and changing the industry? I, I think the one, you know, the, the first instance uh, was actually the acquisition of the domain name um, Voices.com. Um, some people might recall we actually started as interactivevoices.com. It was a mouthful um, you know, you would have a, you would have a, a profile URL like Toby Ricketts dot interactive voices.com is really long. Um, people didn't know if it was singular or plural. So I wanted to change the domain name and rebrand. Um, and the short version of the story is rather than a wholesale Voxio or Vox.com, um, we thought rather a name simplification. What if we could just be voices like voices.com. And so, uh, we were successful in obtaining that name, um, from another uh, from an, a, another website owner at the time, and basically you know rebuilt and redirected um, you know the website on this uh, Voices.com uh, URL or this address. So I think that was critical, Toby. After that, we had r- reporters from CNN contact us. We had great search results. Um, kind of just became more memorable, short and memorable, and uh, unlikely that someone could misspell it. So I think that was very helpful in. Uh, establishing the identity um, early on. And then, so that was, uh, you know, something that was memorable uh, to me. And then, honestly, we actually kind of, you know, stuck to our knitting for a good, uh, you know, t- you know 10, 12 uh, years uh, and, you know, had aspirations for creating a, you know, really a global uh, global platform for voiceover in, uh, in which case we realized, you know, financially probably just couldn't, continue to pull this off on our own. Um, and so we sought out a, uh, an investor, which a lot of tech companies are going to say, hey, I can, I can get this kind of proof of concept phase. And then you achieve what's referred to as product market fit, meaning you've got a product, a platform or what have you, and there's a market out there, voice talents, clients who are looking to hire them. Do we have something that's working? And is it working at the scale of like, 10,000, 20,000, like there's enough volume there that with additional, you know, sales and marketing dollars, like, you know, can we go and acquire 10 times as many uh, customers onto the platform? So that was really the, uh, the, the journey that we had was to realize, yeah, we probably need a sophisticated partner. Um, you know, and I say we as in Stephanie and I, uh, who are the two owners and, you know, no board of directors or anything along the, at that time. And, um, you know, as, as, many, as many of you know, we ultimately uh, ended up uh, raising uh, what's called a Series A, which is kind of the first, first money invested into the company, institutional money invested into the company with Morgan Stanley, a global investment bank, you know, uh, well-regarded, prestigious Wall Street firm. Um, and it was out of their San Francisco Silicon Valley office. Uh, and they look for, you know, high growth tech companies. Uh, and so we fit the bill um, and, uh, you know, and ab- uh, we're able to, uh, to secure that uh, investment, as I say, of, of, of $18 million. And so part of that, uh, you know, the outcome of that was, you know, when you, when you go in through an investment process, you actually have to fundamentally answer three questions. You know, how big is the market? And, you know, we had done our own research and built this called total addressable market analysis, and we put it at $4 billion globally. And then, um, you know, and subsequently, we've kind of since validated that with other third-party research firms. And so, you know, in the multi-billion dollar, so big, big uh, growing uh, space. Well, why you? Why you voices? Why are you going to be the ones that lead the way? And that could be great domain name, you know, great traction so far, um, you know, p- positive feedback from customers that they're going to keep coming back 
um, you know, time and time again. So we had to prove why, why we were going to be the ones that would lead. But the critical one was, okay, even if those are true, the investors, and in this case at Morgan Stanley, was critical to knowing, well, why now? Why wouldn't we wait and let you grow a little bit more? And why is now the critical time for us to uh, invest in you? And um, the answer was actually we had uh, started conversations with, uh, with a company called Voice Bank, which uh, for those who are maybe unaware, Voice Bank was a similar online marketplace, um, more of a directory, but similar type of approach um, that connected uh, ad agency producers, mostly at ad agencies, with uh, the kind of traditional talent agency. Now, you couldn't go on to Voice Bank as an individual talent. Your agent had to uh, register you. And so uh, Jeff Hickson at the time, who was, who was the founder, he started that in 1998, believe it or not, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. arguably kind of the pioneer of uh, online uh, marketplaces. I think he was, uh, he was ready to, to find a partner and you know, pursue other, other career opportunities. And, and uh, so we, you know, we, we made an offer and, and uh, he liked the looks of it. And so we uh, ended up actually acquiring, uh, acquiring Voice Bank. So that was a big, uh, the capital raise with Morgan Stanley. And then 30 days later, um, kind of tying up uh, this deal with, uh, with acquiring Voice Bank. Um, and, and so those are kind of some of the, the big milestones over the last uh, couple of years. But yeah, huge trends that have happened around AI voices and just the amount of freelance work. Um, you know, the pandemic, I mean, there's lots of paths we could, we could go on, but those are some of the, the highlights and memories from my mm-hmm. perspective. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, I mean, the two key parts of, you know, spending is, so you get all this money um, into the business. Um, one of the, you know, and, and your decisions with what to do with that money will be critical in terms of, you know, the, the success of it. Um, you've got to look after your talent and look after development of the site, which I was going to say at the beginning is is like a thing of beauty, like the interface that you have built with voices. I don't think anyone in the industry could say that it's not, you know, it's, it's the top um, pay to play in terms of the interface, the way that people can take jobs right through from uh, the posting right through to payment and everything. Like it's a complete, uh, I and recommend it to new voice talent because when you're getting into the industry, it offers that complete you know, step by step. This is how a job works, and this is how you get paid, and, and you don't have to start doing all overseas bank accounts and everything like that. So that is the thing of beauty. Mm. And you've obviously spent a lot of money um, in building that, and you've, um, you've you've done a lot of development work, but you've also had to develop that with. Um, like we were talking about before, client acquisition, um, having people calling clients, trying to get people on board to use the, this beautiful platform you've created. Um, what's been your your priority? Has it has it been in the in the client acquisition, or has it been on the development, or is this this is it, is it a balance where both have to r- rise at the same time? It's it's uh, it's you know what I jokingly call it's the chicken and egg problem, right? It's like you you need the you need a platform that is usable, and then you need people to use it. And this tension um, can sometimes occur. Now, what I've learned over time is, you know, through through the guidance of a board of directors, you develop an annual budget. This is all like big business stuff, probably t- tremendously boring. Um, but you develop a budget at the beginning of the year and say, here's where I'm going to make the investments. And, you know, you try to pick a handful because you don't want to do the peanut butter approach. You just spread it so thin that there's nothing that really has an impact. You try to do kind of one, two or three things in a, in a meaningful way uh, over the next year. But, you know, the initial uh, infusion of capital was, you know, you're, thank, you, thank you for observing that as well, too, was we, you know, we, we weren't really a product company in the same way. We had developers. We actually didn't have a vice president of product. There weren't really designers on board. So it was mostly, uh, there was a real need to overhaul uh, that experience. So I'm going to call it like one of the uses of proceeds was all around technology. There was um, the visual user interface. And then I would say the user experience. User interface is kind of what you see and what you're clicking on. But the experience is that sense of flow as you go through step by step, the, the emails that you receive to kind of guide you along the way. Um, so that's kind of the user experience. All that definitely needed to be kind of updated. And it was there, but there were these like moments of friction, kind of like the, the pebble in your shoe that you're just like, oh, if we could just get rid of this, you know, it would, people could go through the process so much smoother. So that, that is, that's certainly taken a couple of years and we're continued to be on, uh, on that path as well too. 
there was a lot of behind the scenes investment, um, you know, namely around kind of job match, like how do we make better matches uh, on the platform, redoing a search engine, um, just things that no one's necessarily going to see, but again, makes the whole thing more efficient. Um, so those are two like, you know, areas of technology um, that were that were key investments. And then you're right, it's like the, the, the uh, outreach um, to generate demand with the clients that was really kind of a sales and marketing investment. And so, you know, we, we actually do kind of pursue both in a continuous, uh, in continuous way. Um, and, and I think that's actually been, you know, really key uh, is that it's not kind of all in on one side or the other or all talent. Because you're right, Toby, that every change or improvement that happens on the client side, we fully recognize that there's a um, complementary or sometimes, hopefully not, but an adverse effect for the talent and vice versa. We do something just because somebody wants a request to happen from the talents, you know, <clears throat> um, the talent is requesting a, a change to happen. We also have to take into account the ramification that might happen with the client. And one, if I may, that's just kind of recent, there's probably nothing more, it's aside from more jobs, that talent want or like, I, well, if I didn't win that one, tell me why, or at least let me listen to the winning audition. Who won the job and how much do they get paid? It's like, well, I don't know if the talent's okay with that. And even if they were, I don't know if the client would be okay with knowing because a lot of the clients are like, it's a non-disclosure, you know, uh, confidential campaign. They don't want the audio leak. They don't want to know who won it. They like, don't want anything like that. So it's that kind of, tension that we feel kind of pulled between mm -hmm. that these are really good ideas but every every um you know initiative kind of has like it, it affects both sides of the marketplace so we just try to be thoughtful about uh, about making those changes but yeah th th those are the kind of areas that we're making you know technology mm. investments and then marketing investments that's so true i'm glad you brought up about the uh, the talent feedback thing because that, that's that is number one of the number one thing i hear from especially new talent who haven't necessarily won their first job yet and they're throwing auditions at the wall and they just feel like they maybe get a like and so many new talent are basing everything they do on how many likes they get. And I mean, as like, I, I don't, I, I tend to throw auditions at the wall and, and never look back. Like, I don't even know if I get likes or anything. I just kind of move on. And if I get a job, it's a nice surprise. But mm -hmm. when you are starting out and looking for any kind of data point to improve your performance, the, the P2Ps aren't really much help because the, it is literally, the, there's just no data coming back at you, which is why things like Grave for the Brain and, and coaches um, are so important to give that feedback and, and make sure people are improving. Is there a way to perhaps like gamify it for clients so that they're rewarded for when they do give feedback? Um, and I've done casting. I know how exhausting it is when you get like 80 you know, auditions to listen through. It takes mm -hmm. a long time just to listen to them, let alone give feedback. But if, I don't know, they were able to give spot feedback. I'm sure you've done work on this to see how feasible it is and whether it's possible. Yeah, we've tried, we've tried a few things. Um, you know, and one uh, in particular is, we actually called it audition feedback, is when they're going through, <clears throat> if, they, if they add to a short list or they click hide to kind of remove it from view, it's like, either popping up uh, a window that says, oh, well, you know, and, and it has to be very um, objective feedback. Because mm -hmm. as soon as it's mm -hmm. subjective, then it's like, the client doesn't want to have to rationalize or explain why Toby, mm -hmm. they loved or didn't like your voice for this particular, you know what I mean? They're just, they just feel like they're opening themselves up. No one wants to kind of write the thanks, but no thanks letter, if you know what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. So I think there's the hesitation from client, uh, from the client to do so. And so the audition feedback was like, I hear plosives, too much sibilance, um, mm. background noise, uh, noise floor, reflective space. Like it was things that hopefully the client could hear uh, when they're going through uh, through those auditions. Um, but the uptick of that was like, a f it was like 0.1% of people even for like of jobs, even like got a single audition feedback. We're like, this is, this is kind of becoming one of those pebbles in the shoe to to for the client who's just like can i please just hire the talent and kind of get on with it mm -hmm. so i think we've concluded that you're right gravy for the brain other coaching facilities and individual coaches are really the best channel uh in our experience to get that personalized one-on-one -on -one feedback um and a, a one way to do that would be downloading an audition you know 
you know, if the client's got a job posting, if it's not confidential and, you know, show, show your coach, here's the job, here's my audition, how might I Im- improve? Mm. And for a while, we actually had an on-site uh, audio engineer who would, in effect, do this, you know, pro bono uh, at Voices. And the number one thing that, that made the difference in the audio quality is literally just, I wouldn't resort to like a normalizing, but it was literally just the perception that clients perceive loud auditions to be better quality, rightly or wrongly. It's just, you're not competitive if you, if you sound like this and you're whispering and I can barely hear you, you know, versus, you know, literally leaning in to the microphone can be the difference between that presence that's sounding. Now, I'm not advocating that I'm a, I'm a coach or, you know, anything, but like, that's what we found was this perception of sound loudness was actually what clients viewed as like better quality versus not so good quality. So that could be using a compressor. It could be making sure you have a limiter on there so you're not, you know, cracking out. And it could be just working the mic a little bit closer to give it a little bit more of an intimate read that has more presence. So hopefully uh, those are helpful tips, but you wouldn't know that. There's no technology that's gonna identify that. That's why, again, talk to a coach, give them some auditions and it's like, oh, I'm hearing a lot of your room tone. Like how far away are you from your microphone? Take a picture of that setup, of your setup, like a selfie and like, oh, I normally, I normally stand back here when I'm recording the auditions. Like, oh, well, that might be the problem. There's three feet between you and your microphone. You know, it's, you would be surprised. Um, and so those kind of quick tips, take a photo, send it in or, or an audition into your coach. Hopefully they can uh, provide some guidance. Yeah, absolutely. And no, that's that, that's great. And it's, it's very useful to hear that you went down the track about feedback. So that's super useful. Um, just to go back, this is a quite a specific um, piece of feedback and sort of a question for the Oceania region, which I obviously look after for Grave of the Rain. I'm based here. I have lots of students here who use the Voices.com platform and have I don't see that many jobs for Australia, New Zealand uh, accent requirements and things. I, I wondered whether you have a, a a very North American focus. Do, do you intend to be like a global company providing global voice services or are you sticking to your netting until you kind of dominate the America and then you'll go global and go into Europe and go into Oceania or what's your kind of strategy globally for getting yeah. the actual work? Well, you know, the, one of the challenges is be, um, the barrier to be kind of the true global company um, would be just the, the simple fact of, of language. So right now, the entire platform is all English. Um, we transact only in U.S. dollars. So right away, we kind of are predisposed, if you will, to serve the needs of a predominantly North American uh, clientele. And so to put some numbers um, behind that, despite us working with clients and who, you know, in 160 countries around the world, 76% are in the US, uh, 8% in Canada, right? And well, it's 10% Europe, and I'm just glancing down at my screen because uh, I wanted to be prepared around this kind of whole whole notion. Well, it's 10% in Europe of, cl- of clients, most of them in the UK. So you start to see this theme. It's like, it's basically English speaking countries even though 4% in uh, what we just call Asia, uh, Asia Pacific or APAC, mm. it's 4% of clients in APAC. So there you go, Toby, right away. It is definitely a much smaller portion, but even even though it's all APAC, truth be told, it's basically Australia, New Zealand, um, and 2% in Latin, Latin America. When it comes to the languages of jobs that are uh, posted in, and, and filled, 83% are in English. Um, now, there's a number of kind of accents um, you know, re- requested underneath there. Um, we've got some work uh, to do, uh, you know, this upcoming kind of period, uh, next three months on cleaning up this like accents list we've, uh, and, and languages, but Thank nonetheless. Goodness. I've been asking yeah, for that for so long. It's that's, I know, that's music it's, to my ears. <laughs> yeah, well, it's because, well, one, I mean, you, you have a, uh, I think built a personal brand on a global accent, which is like, how do we, like, honestly, these conversations come up, like, how do we enable that to happen? Um, You know, not only for Toby, but, you know, recognizing that sometimes clients have this, like, I, this, this je ne sais quoi, I don't quite know what this worldly accent familiar, but I don't quite, can't pinpoint it. Um, But, you know, professional and bold speaking of like, 
the 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 voice of the future type um, type accent, and they just don't know how to kind of pick that. Um, and so that is um, this this. We just want to have the the language is English, and then a separate drop down for all of these uh, regional accents. Perfect. So that is uh, that's that's definitely upcoming. And you can imagine once we make that improvement, you know, talent need to update their profiles to make sure like, hey, you've got this data structure so that when a client invites you to a particular job um, or posts a job, I should say, you know, you, you get invited. It's creating some strange invitations that are happening with the current structure right now, um, which uh, we're, we're well aware of. And I, I think it's just it's just overdue. I think it's it's gotten to the point. But yeah, to, I mean, to, so, you know, again, to answer your question, it is Vast majority North America, um, just being candid, 83% English, 5% Spanish, Fren uh, French is 4% uh, of all the jobs, and then kind of goes down the list um, from there. So for the time being, <clears throat> concentrated, but, um, you know, we, we do run, you know, Google ad campaigns, um, trying to reach clients in the UK, in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, I, I just think kind of like just from their you know, size, mm. uh, the U S mm. continues to be the, 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 the dominant market that, uh, you know, that the platform resonates with. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I do think that the marketplace in Oceania here is, is a number of years behind the U S you know, the U S has really, um, you know, took the online voiceover thing first and has really run with it. And, um, Australia especially still seems to be caught in the, the, the bricks and mortar agency model. Um, I talked to Luke Downs, who's one of the, the, um, the leader of RMK, which is one of the biggest agencies there and it still seems very like everyone's very happy with that arrangement and so for big sort of you know uh, national campaigns it's not going to change in the short term but I feel like there's there is there's a lot of little tiny you know seedling companies coming up that are, that are just small at the moment and, and can't afford to go to an agent and so like the, the, the pay to plays fill that that perfectly in terms of like low to medium budget jobs um, they you know they need a broad spectrum of talent especially but they just they don't necessarily know about the online voiceover thing so I I kind of wondered whether there was um going to be a marketing push into these areas or maybe some phone calls um, going out or something um, so that you know more of more of that work um, could come for these voice artists who are um, investing in voices.com but not really seeing that many jobs posted unfortunately yeah we I mean we we do have a small global uh, sales team um, that but again we're, we're more responding to inbound inquiries as opposed to part part of the you know challenge is that we're just not aligned on um, you know, uh, time zone, you know, do you, like when we pick up the phone, we don't want to be calling people in their sleep, um, and, and, and vice versa. Um, so it's, um, but it's interesting you bring that up that Australia, and we actually found that to be the case in, in Japan in particular, cause we're like, wow, it's like world's number one anime market. This is going to be great. And they're like, nope, everything's in person. Nobody has home studios in Japan. Um, and, it, and we were just like, wow, if, if the kind of structure on the ground isn't conducive to doing business th through these online marketplaces, like I, I don't know how to change that where mm. you're I think a, you know, good observation that there's almost this, this willingness to plug in a microphone, to download software, you know, from a certain group of people who seem to be, you know, predominantly in the States um, or like real go-getter aspiring voice talent who are like, if, you know, if I, I can't just go, go get an agent, I'm going to have to kind of like enter into this, uh, into this industry kind of using the newest, latest, greatest tools. And I'm going to have to probably learn it all myself and then not necessarily, um, no one's going to kind of, you know, t teach me completely free. I'm going to probably get the first, go through the first couple uh, you know, videos, lessons, you know, tutorials on how to use Audacity or uh, Adobe Audition or wh whatever um, the, the software is, you're going to have to put that effort in yourself and then, you know, maybe win a client or two. I think then, you know, agents are going to be certainly more likely to be uh, taking, uh, taking your call. Mm, yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, I want to switch tech a little bit because um, I'm aware that we're having such a great time talking that we're not getting to some of the questions I wanted to ask. And some of the, um, sure. the, the talent on uh, Great for the Brain had uh, questions as well. Um, one was around the, um, the, the Voices.com terms and conditions. Uh, a number of years mm. ago, the, there was a big update to terms and conditions that said something along the lines of, you know, like we own any audio you upload and we can use it for whatever purpose. Um, 
I mean, I, I, I get that. Like these days, this, there's in, in aside from the pay to plays and agents and everything, there's been this, this, this pressure from clients that they want to own the audio. They're paying for it. They want to own it and use it for whatever they want. And perhaps it's a, it's a, um, a response to that. But is that still the case that the terms and conditions for, for voice artists say that, you know, anything you upload to the platform, we can use for whatever we want? Because people were worried that it was a TTS learning algorithm thing and that, that mm-hmm. you know, auditions were being used to train um, AI voices. Yeah. It, can you put any of that to, to, to bed? Is that the Yeah, case? no, I, 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 trust me, I'd love nothing more than that. Um, for, first off, I mean, our, our business is to run a marketplace. We're not a tech company. We're not, we're not, you know, we're not going to compete with Google and Amazon to cr- create synthetic voices or AI voices. I mean, listen, they're, they're, <laughs> they have thousands of engineers working on this kind of project and they're decades ahead. So I, you know, that's, it's never been our heart's desire to even enter, uh, that space. The reason why, uh, and so we haven't, uh, for exceeding clarity, we've not sold data sets. We've not, you know, of, of auditions, um, you know, no desire, nothing on a strategic roadmap to even enter that space. I think, you know, to, to reuse the phrase of sticking to our knitting, what are we really good at? You know, and we ask ourselves this, like, what, what is it that we do? It's like we run a marketplace that connects clients and talent to fulfill these jobs. And that's, you know, as, as simple as it is, we're kind of a straightforward, very candid, you know, clear, simple bunch, um, uh, you know, smart people, but it's like, some of this stuff is just, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, speculative at best and like kind of fear mongering at worst, which is not constructive for us. And I've just learned a, a while back to, um, you know, not engage and trying to defend all of this. It's like, let's just keep doing our thing. Uh, And it was actually uh, one of our board members who gave me a great line, Toby, which is there's kind of, you know, two different mindsets you can have, especially as a leader of a tech company. You can be, you know, the competitive mindset and be fearful and worried about what so-and-so is doing and what are they building and what someone said about you. But that can really bring you down, right? You're kind of always looking over your shoulder. Or you can have the creative mindset. And the creative mindset is like, here's our vision. Here's where we want to go. Here's what we're going to build on our strengths. And we've just opted and I think collectively agreed, let's build on our strengths of what we know instead of anywhere kind of dabbling in, you know, unknown areas that are highly controversial that actually don't support our core business. And so here's kind of the other funny thing about that um, speculation that, that we, we were even ever going to enter into the space. We've, I, I'm, I'm very proud of what Voices and the team here has built. We built an incredible business. Why would we cannibalize all of that by building a synthetic or AI voice? You know, it's, it's literally trading dollars for pennies. It doesn't make any sense because you build that machine once, then it's just going to crank out automated voices for for pennies where we used to be able to live out uh, a vision of providing uh, income for talent and um, as well as for all of the employees here at Voices. So it actually undermined our core business operation. So that was kind of um, point uh, point point number one. Um, but but if, if, if I may, I think, you know, like, well, why did we have anything in the terms of service at all. The only, you know, the only reason we needed to is because like, listen, no one's waiving their rights and giving us indefinite use of, of their audio. What was happening is the client would, you know, ghost disappear. And we would say, oh, you owe us, um, for, you know, you know, that it would, be on a credit card, the credit card would fail, they, they would still use the file, and we would have to chase down that client. And then we would be getting into these um, disputes that the client would say, well, you don't have the right, why are you reaching out on behalf of the talent? And we'd say, so that we concluded with, you know, advice of our, uh, you know, law firm, it's like, you need to temporarily own this as the file passes through your system. Right? You're, you're having this file upload into your system. Who owns that? And we say, well, we will own it until it's paid for. And once the client's paid for, then it's a transfer of ownership. So you can 
for those who are interested, they can look up a transfer of ownership. Hmm. Um, so it's this kind of like, almost like clearing house temporary state that it sits in um, so that in the unlikely and hopefully doesn't happen situation that the client does, um, you know, payment doesn't get fulfilled all the way. Sometimes we issue terms where the client can pay us 30, 60, 90 days later. We've paid out the talent the net on, the, on the Friday, but sometimes there's this kind of holding period. If for some reason we need to have the legal recourse to actually go down and chase that client to recoup the money that we've already paid the talent for. So that was the entire spirit of what we were trying to achieve. Um, I think it was around the same time of a lot of other AI voice companies and this whole voice first phenomenon and smart speakers and Google Home launching and like all of this stuff that um, I think unfortunately some might have connected dots that just uh, that just weren't there to connect. Mm, mm, absolutely. Oh, well, that, thank you for for putting that to bed. That's because that's 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 that was an answer I wasn't exactly expecting. But it's like th there are these funny things with uh, with fine print and and legal stuff, which I'm. I'm completely allergic to. I have to say, like I, know, I basically don't read. Who does read terms and conditions these days? They're about sixty-seven pages long. But uh, but it was something that, that was mentioned to me um, in, in preparation for this interview that that was you know that was something that, that sort of turned people off a while. So it's it's a very interesting to hear that perspective. Yeah, there was a, um, there was a there was a clubhouse as well um, that I was that I popped in on. It was like the same question um, and same concern. And I like rightful, legitimate concern. If you haven't, if you, if, if maybe somebody doesn't understand, again, I'll, I'll use the term like the spirit and intention behind what we're trying to do. So any, any change that we're going to make to a terms of service, it's, it's really to provide better protection for the job and all three parties, talent, client, and voices. Um, some examples are we actually, when we acquired voice bank, we actually had to add a whole section in for union jobs for at which the time we were facilitating union jobs through the through the platform. And then later we had to do a terms of service update when we removed that because there actually wasn't as many union jobs as, as we had, had thought. Um, we recently added around usage, right? Some better and clearer definitions around usage. You know, one, uh, 13 weeks, one year in perpetuity, um, you know, different. So, so we needed to define uh, those terms and then uh, last one, if I may, just as an example, um, is around, it's called COPA, which is the Child Online Protection Act. And mm. we basically recognized that we didn't have a um, adequate way to, uh, without just kind of asking, like verify people's ages on the platform. And while there are sites that are just like, tick the box and agree, we didn't feel comfortable with that. So you know, now the requirement is you need to be 18 years old to use voices. And that was a bit of a heartbreaker in and of itself um, that we, you know, refunded child memberships. Unfortunately, told some kids, parents that we can no longer support their, their kids online. We just wanted to provide kind of um, a more robust parental controls. We just didn't have the infrastructure. I think these are all kind of growing up and coming of age of our own. Um, and unfortunately, they get some of them are, are included in terms of services, you know, updates that despite kind of best efforts, um, you know, most, as you said, most people don't care about the legalese. Mm. And if you do, it's like, oh, if the assumption is, well, they're trying to do something nefarious with them. It's like, again, I, I'll go back to if the, if, if really our business is based upon shared success, why would we try to squeeze something like that into a terms of service? It, it's, it's actually a disservice to, uh, to all parties. So, um, thanks, thanks for letting me just give a couple examples of like when and why we make uh, terms of service changes. Sure, absolutely. So um, we are getting towards the end of the window. It's been a fantastic chat, and I hope you've got a few more minutes to just answer a couple yeah, more questions I have. Um, and I feel like we need to cover as well your most recent launch, uh, Like, because looking, you know, this is the present, looking towards the future, you've just launched, um, you know, creative services, which mm -hmm. is a big change um, for Voices.com, taking the model you've done with Voices and then applying it to translation and translating it to audio production as well. Um, so tell us about how that came about and sort of like what and, and what, what the now that it's been a month or two since it launched, like what kind of feedback and what kind of uptake have you seen on the platform? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, how it came about is I think we're, we're, we're looking at this this platform that we've created and, and uh, also uh, the incredible talent that are, uh, you know, call voices home, if you will. 
and looking at these profiles and how people describe the, their artistic abilities, what you can do. And so we did this kind of big data look to develop what we call a skills inventory. We took all the profile information of like, what are the keywords that are coming up? And is it just VO? Or are people saying, oh, actually I can edit audio, I can mix in music. Um, you know, I speak three languages and I can also translate them. And that was, you know, I, I want, another one of these aha moments to realize the hardest part is probably, you know, or one of the hardest parts is like building up a community of people who are talented and multifaceted. And here, all the information is kind of sitting there at the ready. The question then is, well, you know, would any client want to actually hire, you know, a talent for another creative service? And when we look back over the years of, again, the jobs uh, that were being posted, some jobs would say, I'm actually looking to have my script translated and then recorded in Spanish. And we realize, okay, they're, they're actually asking for this, but it's two services kind of bundled in one. Might they actually post two different jobs? Maybe you want a translator who has certain industry expertise, like pharmaceuticals or financial services or healthcare. And so that kind of, you know, got us thinking if we have the talent and it looks like there's clients um, that are, that are uh, wanting additional services, then um, perhaps we can, you know, leverage and utilize this infrastructure we already had. I mean, voice is going to be, you know, the heart of the production. It really is, you know, I, I use this phrase all the time, like breathing these words to life. But inevitably, there's pre-production services, writing the script, translating it, and then the VO gets done. And then perhaps, or you know, perhaps even inevitably, there's some post-production services as well. It could be as simple as you know, converting file formats. It could be editing out breaths. It could be chopping this one long recording into chapters for e-learning modules, um, that type of thing. So there might be some audio editing, mixing in music and so forth. And that's where like, I felt it was consistent uh, with kind of creating this definitive destination that we're, we're, not, uh, we're not veering off into, you know, hiring any freelancer, web developers and executive assistants. It's creative talent. Mm. And mm. let's call it creative talent that are in these, you know, circles, if you will, of influence around the human voice. And so I think we're, you know, we've, I'd start to struggle to get kind of too far out there with, you know, potentially others, but writing seems like a natural one. Like that's actually a big challenge for clients who are like, I've got, mm. I want to do a podcast ad. That's great that you have the voice, but like, I need someone that I can just talk about my product mm. interview and have them write a script. Yeah. And so we don't really offer that kind of writing right now. So that, that might be something that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're contemplating. Um, but I think we've kind of got the, the essence of it now. Um, the hope is that all of this drives more VO activity because it's kind of like pre and post production, give client that great uh, end to end service. Uh, and hopefully they, uh, they, they come back and, and uh, you know, are looking to hire another creative talent in the future. So you still see, you know, voice is definitely at the core and these are going to like complementarily sort of add work for voiceovers as well. And I mean, like myself, I also offer audio production because I'm from a radio background. So it's mm -hmm. another sort of an income stream for people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're, you're not alone. That's what we find. And, we, and that's exactly how we also describe them are complementary and adjacent categories. It's like, oh, what's kind of like one next to what is currently there? Um you know, and so that that's really where where we see that ultimately will build into kind of more and more robust voice uh, voice jobs themselves. Um, you know, perhaps one day we'll like a client will say, I'm going to create a, a project folder and then have multiple jobs in here where I can kind of better organize uh, the type of creative work um, that I want to get done. Um, you know, another example would be what we're seeing is that brands have not been thinking, or let me take another crack at that, that brands have been thinking of themselves only in visual and uh, visual terms for years. Color, shape, space, you know, layout. Um, what they haven't been thinking about is what their brand sounds like until really the last couple of years. Now they're thinking, do we need to have a sonic logo or an audio logo to go 
to coincide or to complement the visual identity? What's our sonic identity? And so that might mean like music kind of composition. We're seeing some of these jobs, um, you know, start up as well too. But for all of this, I, you know, I, I'm excited with the whole world of sound. I think it's early days still where, you know, we're not necessarily going to be, if, if there's any time we're fatigued from being in front of, you know, screens, it's probably over the last 18 months. I, you know, there's lots of times where I'm just like, I just want to listen, right? I want to learn. I want to be entertained, entertained could be a podcast, could be an audiobook. I want to listen to some training or university courses. Um, so I think there's a kind of a, you know, a whole other world of audio only or audio exclusive um, opportunities, both for, for brands and organizations that are trying to uh, get those important messages out there. So hopefully mm. we can be a small part of that. Yeah, well, audio is really coming into its own, isn't it? Like you say, with the rise of podcasts, with um, the, the fact that audio has found its advantage in that you can do something while you're listening to audio, especially with podcasts, yes. like in audiobooks. I find like I cannot sit down and read a book because my mind wanders and I want to do other things. But if I can drive or do the gardening or do some building and listening to an audiobook or podcast, then like you get two things done with one stone. And I really enjoy, you know, that, that kind of experience. Um, so and I'm, I'm glad that, you know, that, that Voices is, is seeing that and, and, and uh, you know, using the platform to kind of leverage that uh, to, to, for audio professionals like myself to, to do more work. It's fantastic. Um, I want to get to some of our member questions. A few of these are sort of, you know, um, I think are answered more on your sort of help, like how to get 100% voice match and stuff, which we haven't quite got time to go into, but is, is, is I think, dealt with with your talent services team. Um, now, one of the big ones was um, some of the pay-to-plays are very guarded, some more than others, about... Um, whether client uh, whether voices can work directly with the clients like after they've found them on the platform like like voice one two three uh, obviously you know just puts you in touch with the client and and you're left to, to your own devices do your own invoicing and everything and it can go wrong or it can go right which it does most of the time um whereas voices.com has always had this sort of like you know you deal with the client through the platform which is very convenient um but it also sort of you know um it, it keeps the, the the talent and client separated but recently it seems like there's been a softening of that um voices.com in terms of you know um clients getting in touch with talent and then after the big job maybe working working directly after that is that something that voices.com um is allowing or endorsing um or is it still preferred that you keep everything you do sort of through the platform yeah it really it really is preferred to keep everything through the platform there's there's a couple of reasons uh, on that um you know one i think we we cultivated that client in the first place um and we you know want them to come back not only to hire you but perhaps another colleague maybe they're looking for a female talent the next the next go around or a different language so the more they can kind of learn and 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 embrace and understand how to get the most of the platform i think that actually benefits the community as a whole um the other reason is as you said sometimes the transactions don't go as expected <clears throat> and in those situations talent would come to voice and say Hey, this this client, you know, still owes me the money. We're like, well, we don't see the job on the platform, and then it, you know, puts us in a bit of an awkward. Say, oh, they hired you once last year, and they're like, no, 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 I just got got hired by them last week, and we're like, we don't see it. Um, so I think if if we can be helpful and supportive um, in that, um, that's one. But there's actually a pretty big reasoning why, you know, if I could be so bold, why talent would want to keep. Um, you know, clients hiring them through uh, through voices, uh, it builds your ratings and reviews. You get more compliments, which again are additional signs of activity and credibility on the platform. You're at the top of what we've now rebranded the leaderboards. And a lot of clients just go right to these leaderboards and just like, show me the top 100 most recently hired favorites, most listened to talent this week, this month, all time. It's kind of like a shortcut for them just to get access to. Now, if you keep the the, the, the transaction on platform, you're going to be visible on, on, on those lists. So hopefully those are kind of a couple quick reasons, um, uh, you know, both that I think we can be helpful and there's a, uh, you know, a, a rationale on um, some of the benefits for keeping, uh, keeping the jobs and, and that communication uh, going through, uh, through voices. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's good to, to know because that did come in a couple of times. Um, and... Yeah, the other thing about you know, um, 
lots of pro talent um, who might have, you know, tried voices in the past and left the platform. A few of them were saying, you know, we've heard that sort of voices.com has has sort of, you know, changed somewhat, or at least the perception has changed, the, the, the attitudes have changed. We want to kind of try again, but we don't want to necessarily have to buy a year. And they were talking about, like, a free month for people who have been a member of Voices before and then come back. Is that something you consider like a like a, a welcome back sort of deal or, oh, or something that's a, to it? No, I think, I mean, sometimes we, you know, from time to time we might do a discount on the offering, but, you know, um, I, I actually hadn't uh, heard that as kind of a, a welcome back gift, if you will, of, because mm. um, I, I understand the the hesitancy is, you know, it's, it's $500 for an annual subscription. Um, now, if you were successful on the platform before, then um, likely if you put in the effort in that first, you know, month or two, um, you're probably going to win a job or two and we're just going, okay, now I, I see how it works, how it's different, um, how it's better than, than maybe three or four years ago. Um, be willing, you know, kind of, t- you know, to, uh, to invest for the next year. So uh, great feedback. Something else we're considering would maybe be like a, a lower uh, limited, um, you know, entry level membership. Like fi- $500 is a pretty big jump to go from zero to 500 Maybe something like a hundred, but you're, you know, perhaps uh, limited in the, the number of jobs you can see or the number of jobs you can reply to, something along those lines. Mm. Um, mm. So I'm not sure if you want to relay that back uh, back mm. to the team, but because there's kind of the two uh, constituencies. There's like new talent that are just like, I want to give this a go, but I'm not sure mm. I have $500 to make a go of it for a year. I want to I want to do a sprint, right, for mm. like 30, 60, 90 days. Mm. So maybe ninety ninety nine dollars for a year just is a little bit more economically viable. Um, but yeah, and then then there's the people that we would love to win back because I think there's they were talented before. If you're successful, you know how it works, um, and hopefully we've uh, you know overcome a lot of the uh, the, the the challenges, growing pains <laughs> I often mm. call them mm. uh, of uh, of years uh, gone by. And I would certainly love to to earn the trust. Uh, and, uh, and 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 re earn that relationship with uh, with all those talent who are looking to uh, to rejoin. So yeah, don't don't be shy. Send me an email, and uh, we, I'm sure we can. Uh, you know, I can I can answer any of those you know difficult questions that you want to throw my way. Uh, you know, it's pretty pretty straightforward. I'd, I'd be happy to uh, to answer those for you. Fantastic. Oh, well, that's that's really good to hear. And uh, and you know the, and you know transparency is one of those things that that has really uh, I think you've worked hard on in the last um, four years and has really come to fruition um, in terms of being transparent with on the platform, um, especially the in the area of kind of um, you know managed jobs um, or the, yep. you know I, I always tell people there's there's two kinds of jobs on the platform: there's the self service and the and the account managed jobs. Um, one being a bit more like a like traditional voice agent or you know helping the clients along the journey. One's completely them on their own. Um, um, yep. That that when did you institute that service at, out of interest and and like do you what's the kind of split of jobs between uh, just off the top of your head if you happen to know those figures oh no between- yeah we, we we actually kind of obsess over this one as well too um, so to answer that the, the split is is about ninety ten so it's ninety percent of the jobs are now self service um, this is uh, I'm, I'm sharing a little bit of the playbook here but it's what we call our platform first strategy which basically is. We should have, uh, you know, a, 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 a default or a bias to push as much of client activity to hire talent directly through the platform. That should be our default posture. It's only in those edge cases where the client is like, I don't have time, I don't want to do this, or I've been working with a particular account manager for years, I've built the trust with them. Um, but usually it's in what we call these kind of more complex projects. They're not, you know, for the most part, you know, they're not 30 second commercials. Sometimes they're like a hundred hours of corporate training material in like, you know, or 10 hours in 10 different languages kind of thing. Multi-voice, multi-language. Um, you know, that that's where we're trying to get to. So that mix has dramatically changed. At one point it was probably like 50-50, which um, I think was kind of the origin where maybe s- talent were starting to get uncomfortable that uh, with kind of the direction. And uh, we definitely corrected that. You know, I think we can get it to probably 95% uh, percent of jobs um, are self-service where we don't, we don't need to be involved. Th- the intention is the old kind of, you know, teach a man to fish, if you will, teach that client 
Mr. or Mrs. Client how to use the platform. It's very intuitive and very straightforward at this point. And if we can, um, to use a, a software term, like onboard that client appropriately in using it, uh, y- using voices and get them through that first job, they'll realize, hey, I can do this on my own. And so that's really been um, the approach that we've been taking over the last couple of years. Um, but it, it did come about because, you know, the, this managed service, we, I mean, we call it professional services, uh, you know, I- internally. It came about because there were a couple of Fortune 500 companies that said, we don't have the ability, like we did some searches, we don't have the ability to um, use a credit card. So there was this like payment friction. We want to hire somebody, but can you get on our vendors list? And then can, can you send us an invoice for the person? So there's this payment issue. Another client, it was a legal issue. They're like, we, your terms of service aren't sufficient. You got to sign our legal documents and um, kind of like you need to be quote unquote on the hook for this particular transaction if uh, and this particular project. So those were the reasons we started and they were complex projects at the outset. And I think what we've found is for the most part, that's why we've bolstered up the agreements uh, functionality on voices. It's, uh, it's also why we've provided other payment mechanisms. Clients can pay by all manner of credit cards or actually request an invoice. We have certain clients that are on those kind of special payment terms. Um, and so we've addressed those two, you know, previous objections, like why, why, and needs that the clients had, why they had to go with professional services. So we're really just left with these like big complex projects. And I think they warrant having the extra attention and hands on. Um, I mean, it's, some of the projects have been like hiring hundreds of talent on like massive projects, things that the platform on a self-serve basis is just, it's not, it's not the main reason that it's, it's mostly small projects in and out pretty quickly. Um, it's not the hundred hours of content or um, hundreds of thousands of words that need to be uh, recorded. Um, so that's kind of where strategically we've shifted towards platform first. And as I say, it's 90% now. I think we can get that up to 95 in the next couple of years. Mm, fantastic. That's, that's, um, I wasn't expecting the answer. And that's actually really interesting to know that, uh, that you are pushing that. But then again, it makes perfect sense that if, you, if you, you've built this, this, this brilliant uh, um, interface and website, you know, which, is, which is a behemoth now. I mean, it's fantastically complex. Um, I love the way that now I'm, I'm able to, uh, to, to open up my job page and, and really sort the jobs like in order of priority for my specific needs because of all the metadata that's collected as well throughout the site. So, uh, so yes. well done for that. And I really congratulate you on that, on that fantastic. Fantastic uh, development there. Um, so we've basically reached the end, at the end of the interview. Is there anything that you you want that we haven't sort of discussed that you uh, wanted to go over? Well, I, I just encourage you know new talent that are uh, interested in uh, in the industry, uh, particularly voice talent. You know, read those books, listen to podcasts, watch videos uh, like we have here today. I think what you'll find is that there's there's no golden path to success. You know, every actor. And voice actor that you uh, you know meet or speak to or try to gain some advice from, there they all these little nuances along the way on some key decision or their their kind of moment in time um, that kind of led them to take that next step. So you know, chart your own course. Don't worry about replicating somebody else's. Um, uh, you know, and along the way, yeah, you should be getting a coach. You know, someone to to be your champion measure your success, set those kind of mini goals and, um, and, and determine kind of what that, what that next milestone uh, is for you. But, you know, I, I would leave with that, you know, really chart your own course and developing your own career uh, in this exciting uh, industry of voiceover. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, David. And I'm sure we'll talk again. You got it. Thanks, Toby. 